kiss you go You know this old world ain't fair No child Someday way down the road I'll give you a song Started. Um, thank you all again for joining us today for our book talk uh, featuring Julian Uggen, author of The Properties of Perpetual Light, in conversation with Anna Bordalo. I'm Erica, I'm your host today. I'm with Eastland Books of Berkeley. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Eastland Books, um, we're an Asian American ethnic studies bookstore. We're located in downtown Berkeley. Um, it's a bookstore comprised of a dedicated staff of booksellers, artists, poets, um, community workers. Um, Eastland Books of Berkeley also has a, a nonprofit education arm of the bookstore. It's called Eastland Books Multicultural Services. And it's through this organization that we bring you uh, today's um, author event. Uh, before we begin the program, I would like to take a moment to recognize that Eastland Books sits on the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo Ohlone. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. And we recognize that as members of the Berkeley community, we have and continue to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold the city of Berkeley more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, uh, the UC Berkeley Ethnic Studies Library, the Berkeley Public Library, and the Pacific Islander Initiative at UC Berkeley. Please visit our event page to learn more about these organizations. And special thanks to Summer Saunders from Blue Ocean Law for helping us coordinate this program. So um, a little bit about what's uh, gonna happen tonight um, or this morning for those of you joining us from Guam. Um, we're going to begin with a book reading from The Properties of Perpetual Light. Um, after the reading, Anna Bordalo will join us for a conversation with Julian, and then we'll close out the program for, uh, with an audience Q&A. Uh, so just a reminder, please keep your Zoom settings on mute throughout the program. Feel free to use the chat box to share your questions and comments. We'd love to hear them. Um, and we will be taking um, a, a photograph at the end, um, just, just to let you know. I um, mean, we are recording this segment. So if, um, if, you, for, if you have any privacy concerns, uh, please email us. Um, we'll do our best to, to make some edits, uh, but just so you all are comfortable and know what's going on. Um, so enough of me, <laughs> I'd like to turn your attention to our very special guest, uh, Julian Agen. Julian is an indigenous human rights lawyer and writer from Guam. He is the founder of Blue Ocean Law, a progressive firm that works at the intersection of indigenous rights and environmental justice. He is brilliant, soulful, and deeply engaged in the struggles of people across Oceania to liberate themselves from colonial rule defend their sacred sites and obtain justice for a range of harms inflicted upon them by outside forces. From nuclear weapons testing and non-consensual medical experimentation to extractive industries and climate change. He serves on the Global Advisory Council of Progressive International, a global collective that launched in May 2020 with the mission of mobilizing progressive forces around the world behind a shared vision of social justice. The Properties of Perpetual Light is his fourth book. Please join me in welcoming Julian Agen. Thank you so much, Erica, for the introduction. And thank you so much um, to everyone who's taken their time to come and be with us today. I know that um, so many of us are experiencing like various degrees of fatigue with um, sort of online programming. So we appreciate your time. Um, and your presence with us. Um, so I will be reading um, three total, um, just three short excerpts from the book, um, from my new book, The Properties of Perpetual Life. Um, I've just chosen um, some uh, ones that I think are 
um, would be good for this audience. They're um, relatively shorter excerpts um, in the book. Um, I will be reading three, first being Mugu, second being More Right, and the third being Gao Sali. <clears throat> so I'll just, I'll just start. Mugu. They say if you take the Mugu from a dog's eyes and rub it into your own, you can see the dead. They lied. I know because I tried. After dad died, rubbed more Mugu in my eyes than I care to admit. And that's not the crazy thing. The crazy thing is I didn't have a dog. So I settled for strays, chased those poor dogs all around the neighborhood because beggars can't be choosers. Because desperation, like belief, is a powerful thing. And because I was 10 and could not yet put two and two together, I somehow thought if I could see my dad, I could speak to him too, ask him all my questions. Do you like heaven? Are you and God friends? Do you miss us? Do you miss me? Do you still have a body? Is it chubby like before cancer or skinny like after? What's your favorite food? Mine is cheese, is yours? Is that because Sokka, our family name on your side, means rat? What about Uggen? My teacher says Uggen <clears throat> refers to the family of tubers, as in taros and yams. Why is tuber such a weird word? And how are we related to taros and yams? How exactly? Can you help mom? All she does is walk around sad and cry in that scary way where she shakes but don't make no sound. Also, she faints a lot. Also, can you help Rhea? She don't talk no more, she don't laugh. It's too quiet in the house. Can you come back and make it noisy again? I chased those poor dogs for nothing. I never saw him, never got to ask him all my questions. The medical term for mugu is room, a fancy word for eye gunk, the crust that collects in the corners of our eyes sometimes after a good night's sleep. A natural part of healthy eye function, doctors say, nothing more. But then doctors don't know everything. More right. My Aunt Lou told me once that it is easier for our people to believe in magic than it is for others. As soon as she said it, I knew it was true. I knew because that day she'd taken my sister and me, plus two of our cousins, to a beach on the northern coast of the island where the sand is shaped like stars. We got lost in those stars. We bent over their tiny bodies for hours, inspecting them as closely as we could without a magnifying glass, wishing we had one, even if only one, even if it meant we had to share. We made star castles. We cartwheeled over constellations. We ran around and fell down on a blanket of stars. We took turns burying each other in a beautiful graveyard of celestial bodies. My aunt's husband, a white man from Australia, explained later that they weren't stars at all, but rather foraminifera, tiny single-celled creatures who live at the bottom of the sea, whose exoskeletons wash ashore when they die. Forum sands, he said. He was right, of course, but my aunt was more right. Because eyes wide with wonder is a perfectly good definition of magic. Because magic could just as easily mean stargazing in the midday sun while looking down. Because we had so little, yet somehow, we had it all.
<clears throat> Gal Sali for Judy Wampat, who tried to change the official flower of Guam from the invasive Bougainvillea to the native Gausali and was mocked for it. So much hope for the future rests in a return to the right flower, to Gausali, torchwood of the sea, whose square white flowers cling to no one but the rugged limestone cliffs at the island's edge, whose wood warms us, whose wood will light our way again. That's it. Um, those are just three um, of the particularly short pieces um, that I wanted to share today. Thank you so much, Julian. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing with us. I highly encourage you all to purchase a copy of Perpet Properties of Perpetual Light, uh, which you can purchase through Eastwind Books. I'll share the link in uh, the chat box really quick. There you go. Great. Um, you can also visit asiabookcenter.com um, for, for more details if you miss the, the link there. Um, so now we're going to transition over to our conversation uh, with Julian and Anna Bordalio. Bordalio, I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. Um, uh, she is a daughter of Guahan, whose roots are grounded in the village of Mongmong and Aganya Heights. After transferring from Mount San Antonio College in Southern California, she journeyed to New York to complete, complete her BS in policy analysis and management at Cornell University and to intern for the United Nations Indigenous Peoples and Development Branch. She currently works for the San Gabriel Valley Council of Government's Energy Efficiency, Wildlife Management and Homelessness Programs and was recently accepted to UCLA, Columbia, Harvard and Berkeley Law Schools for fall 2021. Congratulations. Um, her lifelong aspiration is to make Kadu her grandmother's would be proud of. Thank you, Anna, for joining us. I'll turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Erica. And um, thank you, Julian, for, for sharing these pieces and for sharing this space today. Um, I also want to thank everyone here for in inviting me along. Um, I, I, I think I main, mentioned to Angel earlier and, I, and Julian and everyone here that I feel vastly underqualified to be speaking on these topics, but um, I think you'll find throughout Julian's book and throughout these conversations that no one is underqualified. Um, and I think he makes that very clear and makes it very comfortable for us to step into these spaces of activism. And I wanna start from that place of gratitude. Um, Honestly, when I, when I read through this book and, and when I was approached for this talk, my first impressions, um, I cried on the first piece on the foreword and um, alternatively, like, like alternated between laughing and crying throughout the whole book. And, um, you know, I think that's part of the, the dual reality that, I don't know, my, my experience as an indigenous person has had. And um, looking at this book, I, I can see the cross sections of where um, Julian was going with. Um, one thing that I like to start off with when looking at, you know, starting this conversation, Julian is grounding it in very few simple words because I find that I'll start rambling on and on if I go too far. And so three words that popped out to me when I read this book um, and specifically these pieces um, that you just highlighted right now were, were small. I thought it's fantastic that in this talk with so many people and in this space, you chose to highlight objects that were objects that are alive but are also small and to highlight them. So for you know, where where everything from star sand to Mugu and a dog's eyes to you know a flower that's just casually on the cliffs and that in my experience growing up on Guam, I didn't pay a whole lot of mind to but was always there and was a piece of our, our, of our history. 
And so my first question is more along the lines of, of keeping it simple. What are three you, words that you would like to use to set the intention for um, this conversation, this space, or maybe even three values that, or it doesn't even have to be three values because that can be a very long conversation, but a value or two that you feel helps guide you through these works. Thank you so much. That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> for sure, the first word I think of is beauty. Um, the book is very much an attempt to announce the presence of the beautiful. And I say that because there's some, there were so many things happening in 2020 last year when I was writing it, just ridiculously violent things um, here on Guam um, being a militarized colony and everything from the COVID-19 handling or mishandling of the situation to, you know, like sailors coming on board to our lack of decolon our lack of um, self-determination and the constant unearthing of our ancestral remains. There's just so much violence and so much noise. And so beauty felt to me, um, the book, I think the whole book is grounded in beauty, trying to lovingly, um, you know, help people pay attention to it. Um, because it's, it's, you know, it, it, it keeps us alive, you know, sometimes beauty is the only thing keeping us alive. Um, and I think that's the first one. Um, the second is, I think, like you said, um, a, a value instead of a word, I would say, um, this attentiveness to small things, like I was really drawn um, in years ago when I first read Arundhati Roy's masterpiece, um, The God of Small Things. And she, you know, there was a line in there about, she was talking about baby Kuchalma, one of the characters in one of her gardens, but th the line was about paying attention to the whisper and the scurry of small lives. And I was like, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. This book is going to pay attention to the whisper and the scurry of small lives. So that was definitely a, a major theme uh, for me. And the th I guess the third one is just resilience. Um, this, you know, in some ways the book is an ode, you know, to the resilience of the indigenous spirit. You know, we have just been through so much and we've been under a thumb for so long. And, you know, and we've, we know the truth is that there are so many different kinds of dying you know, and we've seen so many of them, our disproportionate share of them. And so, um, yeah, I think that this book celebrates the fact that we are still here. Absolutely, thank you. And, and it's funny that you mentioned, um, you know, if we don't remember and recognize and pay attention to these small things, they're lost. I was just having a conversation with my father earlier about, um, several of the native plants within the northern parts of the islands, within our jungles that we don't necessarily have access to and don't necessarily have the knowledge to, to recreate and recreate those type of medicines. And um, he was saying, you need to talk to your aunties, you need to talk to your aunties. And, you know, it, it was the conversation of, of, if you don't remember, if you don't ask, and if you don't care, show care for these small things, they will be forgotten. And so coming from that place of appreciation and, and jumping right into it, um, I think you press on, a, on quite a few different points. Um, looking at, at Mugo specifically, my first question is kind of, how did you get the, jog, the dogs to stay still enough for you to, for you to grab them? I oh, mean, yeah, it depends on the dog. Sometimes I held them against their will. Um, which was terrible, you know, um, but, um, and other times, you know, it was just like, they were very, um, kind of like, what, what I only know the two more word, nat messy <laughs> type of dogs, I lung at a little bit, like some of them. And so like, I, I don't know, sorry, I don't know the English word for that, but you understand what I'm saying, right? They're just like these dogs, um, that were in the neighborhood and God, you have to understand Mount Santa Rosa, where I was born and raised, it was truly, truly like a universe unto itself. It really is. It's, it's, it's so high up. It's like Guam, you know, we, it's like the island is like 212 square miles. It's relatively very small, right? And, but it's weird and we all know each other and we all, like I can, you know, I know families from every village and I'm familiar with every village, but Mount Santa Rosa is, I don't know, singular. It is hard to describe that area of Guam. It's a gift to go up and drive on that road past Mariana Sierra, all the way up 
you know, past, um, if you go left, you go toward the Anderson Air Force Base, gigantic base, mm -hmm. but if you go to the right, you go up this small row up a hill that gets smaller and smaller and the road is so windy and you're finally up there. And once you get up there, like everything is different. The atmosphere is different everything's different and so we really do feel like a self-contained universe up there it's so in some ways it was like um growing up there was you know so liberating because I was always playing in the jungle right and like and uh, there's like pieces in the book that talk about sort of the, the really rich detail about the natural landscape of that environment um you know because I was always outside with you know these creatures that we're talking about like grasshoppers and tree snails and butterflies and being outside and just, yeah, all of that, but uh, yeah, I don't know how to describe it, but so yeah, it, it's like, it's almost like trapped in time. And just so you know, um, like a week ago, I drove up there again and it had been years. It had been like a decade. And as soon as I made it up to the top of the mountain and got all the way in to the, into the interior, I'm passing all the jungle and the mountain. And I just, I just wept. I just wept for like my childhood self and just having survived that really spectacularly vulnerable moment in my life. Like I would say like a five to seven year period of hell, you know, in some ways having just lost my father. I write all the, but obviously you know about this, not everyone on the call does because they haven't read the whole book, but I really grapple with the loss of my father to cancer and the sort of my nuclear family falling apart, you know, but, but it being taken solace in sort of these other, you know, creatures I'm learning empathy from insects, you know, like that whole, that was my childhood, you know, it's like lost in the universe up there, you know, in the sword grass. I mean, so but yeah, and I like, and it's really just a way to honor that time, which was both really, really liberating, as I said, and very, very lonely. Um, and so, yeah, Anna, honestly, I would say that that is precisely the moment, though, that a writer is born. Because writers are born in moments when we reach for language and it is not there, when words are not at the ready. And our, uh, our capacity like, of self-awareness, we realize, like, I reach for the language to set myself free, and I couldn't find, you know, that. And so what I was trying to do in this book, in some ways, it's, I, maybe I, I, my third word should have been loving, because actually, I think that's the, the, the most important aspect of the book, is that it's loving, and it's not, it's not trying to be clever. The book doesn't give a damn about craft. I'm, you know, there's craft in it, I guess you can say whatever natural ability I have, but I don't give two shits about that. I mean, the book is really about spreading itself out, you know, like a little bridge that other young people who are suffering can make a crossing, you know, they need to be able to get over some difficult terrain and they need help sometimes. And this book tries to help them. Wow, this is a little emotional, it's weird. We, yeah. I've done book talks already, but this is sort of what it is about. It is really loving and it's about that. And that's, and that's, that's just a, a testament to how powerful this book is. Like I mentioned earlier, I cried within the first, <laughs> within, within the first, um, the, the, your, your foreword basically of, to, to the book and going into, to Mugo, especially I thought, you know, at first I thought, man, this guy's crazy. He's going around chasing stray dogs. And then <laughs> you, you, you turn it from something kind of funny and, and almost like ridiculous sounding and then goes into very sensitive and vulnerable places where as a child you don't understand what's going on around you and you're trying to handle grief and there's mm -hmm. not there what there appears to be you know you have to go out and, and find it for yourself how to heal and I think that you know a big part of it is is you know, you don't mention this, you, you don't miss, mention this explicitly, but a big part of it is healing. And I think that, you know, with this book, I think, you know, did you, did you time it? Did you write this book during, during COVID um, to, 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 to help us work through our, I mean, not to help us work through our grief, but more along the lines of what I'm trying to say is that this book is very timely in mm -hmm. that as we're being going through this moment, this this whole year, year and a half of grief, you know, of grief of loss, um, you know, students with with their senses of identity. I've talked to several students lately, where and even my younger brother, who's you know, he's he's finished finishing up his senior year of, of college, and you know, he is struggling to find that that activist spirit that he's had and that's propelled him all throughout college, and and 
thinking about that and thinking about, well, how, how do you go out and help them navigate their grief? And I think this book is a, a really great testament to that. But I'm wondering if you have any advice um, navigating this type of grief, you know, post-COVID loss, you know, any, any thoughts on loss in general and any thoughts about the timing of this book and what you've heard from people with regards to the timing of this book and, you know, the aftermath, not the aftermath, but <laughs> the, the situation of the pandemic. Sure. Um, yeah. So that's a great question um, because it, yeah, the whole book, COVID-19 was the backdrop against which the book was written, you know, in some ways, like our community um, was really up against so many challenges. Um, some of them felt a little insurmountable at the time. And it was, I was overwhelmed and I had just, I was just, I was like overcome by rage and grief, both of those things. And I, and, and that's the thing about sort of like injustice, right? And like in that, like, and all of that, they sort of the atmosphere of that, it gets really, really loud. And so like, I, I just, just, just to get through it, I just had to quiet down, you know, quiet down the noise of the outside world. And the only way I could do it, like I just couldn't not write basically. I just had to write. So the book, it wasn't premeditated. I really didn't expect to start writing a book. You know, that's not like usually what happens, at least not with me because I'm not a full-time writer. You know, I, I'm a human rights lawyer by day. I'm like a moonlight writer. I write like early in the morning or late at night. Like I don't even have time to do it. But, uh, but, it, but it, sometimes it's the only way I can think, you know, or the only way I can breathe is to write sometimes. So ergo, I know I'm a writer, you know, that is like, you know, that is what writers, we feel compelled, we feel called by stories, you know, like, so we, like, I just couldn't not write and I was writing and and then I realized like so much of what I was experiencing, this huge and the enormity of the grief, right? Sometimes certain kinds of grief are just too heavy to bear alone. So you have to bring that grief into the heart of the village and just share it, you know, together. The only way to grieve it is to grieve it together. And I was like, but the only way to do that is to sort of, you know, call from the light of my own life, if that makes sense. I had to start. So and obviously it inevitably, you could say, I, I started, I found myself writing about my first loss which is the loss of my father, which, you know, it, like that, I mean, that was kind of organic, I would say. And so once I started writing about that, I was like, wow, I, this could be a book. Like I, you know, I didn't, I didn't set out with an agenda. You know, I just boarded a bus and I didn't really know anything about the destination. I just, you know, was in for a ride. And so like, it, and halfway through, I knew what I was doing. I knew I had a book and I knew that I, what I wanted it to be about. And so, yeah, and I also didn't want to impose, just so you know, the book is very kind of odd because it doesn't sort of succumb to one structure. It doesn't like bend. I mean, it doesn't like follow the rules. In some ways it's a disobedient little shit, the book, <laughs> because it's like, it's like poetry and a eulogy and a commencement speech and a protest statement. It's all of those things. But I was like, life is truly this like lovely mess. And, the, and this book sort of honors that. It honors sort of how we find ourselves in ill-fitting things. And sometimes you, you need one, only one kind of medium can say a certain kind of thing. You know, poetry does something that the others can't, you know? So I have some of that in there, you know, and like all, all of this. So it's sort of just like, I trusted myself. Again, I just trusted myself enough to present it to the publisher because, because I knew that they were all true. All the pieces were true. They, they, I managed, like, I, there was no pretense. There was no arrogance. There was no cleverness there was no distance between the writer and the reader I eliminated all of that crap you know and I just wanted to just basically I wanted to move in closer and I wanted to breathe on your neck you know this is like this is the kind of intimacy this book is about and I was like because of that the lack of the absence of that distance I think that's why you know the book is moving people like I just just this morning you know I this is how it's been since the book has been released actually for the last few weeks. It's, I'm getting inundated um, with messages from complete strangers everywhere in the world, from here in Guam, but also elsewhere, just saying that the book really helped them get through something or face something, you know, face something that they've been hell bent on not facing, you know? And so it's really, I know that it succeeded because it's, you know, it's, it's just helping people like to, do that thing that they, you know, that they've been struggling with doing and making a difficult decision, you know, or standing by a difficult decision or, you know, or making a new one. Like one, the one from this morning was someone who just, who doesn't know she's, I think she lives in Oregon. She was like saying she was going to, going to, um, she, fi she finished my book and immediately decided to um, take, I guess, 
maybe her mother out of the nursing home or something and just care for her herself because she has Alzheimer's. And this is like the third, like it's like the third Alzheimer's related sort of reader who's like a life or whose loved one's life has been really impacted by Alzheimer's and then they're making a change. Because, you know, I talk about my grandmother who had Alzheimer's and I, something, something about my choice to eliminate the distance between myself and my reader, like between us. And so there's a real relationship. There's some intimacy there that's real. It's, it's really affecting people in real ways. It's not, you know, so this book is, you know, not gonna win anything, but it's gonna help people, which is like all you could ever really, really want, you know? But there is yeah. so much suffering right now. <laughs> No, absolutely. And I think that part of that, the lack of distance and the ability to be vulnerable and, and talk about these experiences is for our audience members that don't understand, that don't know in our culture, it's very common for us to, to not talk about these things. You know, we, we don't talk about issues in our family. We don't talk about going through grief because the idea is that we want to remain strong. We have to remain strong for others in our family and for others in our community. And what's so fascinating and fantastic that I find about, about this book, Julian, is that it's very much an action. <laughs> if it, it, there's its words, but it's also action, as, as you mentioned earlier, where just by the act of expressing yourself and closing the distance between, you know, bet between you know, your emotions and your grieving process and this and your words by talking about these difficult talking topics, you're really, you know, you're healing people through it. And that's just incredible. Um, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, you talked a little bit about trust. And I know that I I I, I was planning on saving this until like later on, but really my question, you know, since we're, we're, we're not following the rules in this one for sure. And I'm glad you mentioned trust because trust, I, I think would, be, would have been another one of the words, the mm. beginning words at the beginning of this conversation is, um, you know, the idea that as we're navigating this grief and, and you know, I, as we're navigating this grief and as we're navigating, as we're, you're, you know, you're in this book, you're really calling forth for young people to, to trust themselves. And do you find that to be a monumental task? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think, um, I think in some of our cultures, for example, like some of the Pacific Island countries that I've served because I, you know, again, lawyer full time, right? But basically I've worked with several Pacific Island governments and I just see this in multiple countries in, in our region where some leadership roles are occupied by people, right? Either who come from whatever, but they're just older people who are powerful elite families, for example. And they, oftentimes I've seen, and this has happened multiple times, um, the young people sort of not taking up space and believing that either because of our cultures which value respect, for example, um, for your elders, like there's this, um, there's this hesitancy and that hesitancy is costing us. It really is, it's costing us because some of the young people have so many gifts to contribute. You know, Some of them are better. They would be better leaders than some of our current leaders. And I've, I've seen this just time and time again. And I was like, I need to write a book, like especially for indigenous Pacific Islander youth who know what their gifts are, who have self-awareness, but whose sort of, sort of sense of like cultural duty or obligation sort of holds them back. You know what I mean? Like when they do that, like all of us, you know, our treasury, you know, sinks in value. You know, we're not building this. And there's so many little things like it's, I've seen in the climate change discussions. I've seen young people with great ideas who are actually ideas more capable of saving the world. Ideas who's, you know, are calling for like state action that matches the latest best available science, for example, but we're not, they're not the ones speaking. So this book is sort of about like, in especially some of the pieces, some more than others, the this book is really in, like, like directly talking to these young, like climate activists, these young indigenous activists from Pacific saying, take up space. You have to like, try, and you have to trust yourself more. And like, so I even wrote the eulogy for Uncle Tony de Bruyne, you know, and so I talk about the experience and he was like a great Marshallese statesman, you know? 
a great Martian statesman who fought for nuclear justice and climate justice for like, his whole life, you know? And I talk about that eulogy, but I also talk about sort of the gifts that he gave me, you know, and he really did. He wanted, you know, us young people who take up the mantle of social justice work to, you know, while on the one hand, we have to respect the people who have paved part of the way, we absolutely have to learn to find our own way in the world, you know, and change circumstances circumstances dictate change action you know like some of the newest problems that we have now you know they require new so, you know they're just these global problems that require global solutions and brand new minds and new ideas we take the best of our old insights and we bring them into the future you know and so some of our like elder generations they're stuck in some ways and i've seen that and so we've had really deep conversations in the marshall islands and and different places with elders and so yeah this book is really about you know, and not everyone will get to know him and get to love him and be loved by him, you know, and learn important political strategic lessons from him. So like, I, you know, it's also like I'm giving it to them what he gave me, you know, I'm just, he, I've been bequeathed certain gifts and now I'm trying to just turn around and like pass it along, pass it down the road, you know, because that's what it's mm -hmm. sort of about. Um, I hope that makes sense. No, it absolutely makes sense. And, you know, I, 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 I want to emphasize um, a chat that just came up um, by by K K K Go. Um, yes, oftentimes our insecurities or silence or imposter syndrome is rooted in systemic oppression or internalized colonization or colonialism. And oh, it's so true. I mean, you know, I write in the other book. I mean, the other essay, "The Ocean Within." I was like, honestly. What I tried, I'm trying to like find words to describe what colonialism looks like. And I sort of settled on this image of like, we take our dreams and we sort of place them in boxes and seal them shut and then shelve them somewhere just out of sight. And maybe that's what colonialism looked like, dreams under duct tape. You know, that's what it is. It's not just the colonization of our lands and seas, but our imaginations. I mean, and all the best artists know this. It's not a new insight. That's what's wonderful too. Nothing is new. It's like, you know, we're just like, all the, like Bob Marley said it all the time. I mean, you know, through his music. I mean, artists of every genre make this same point, you know? Mm -hmm. No, so. absolutely. That, that's the scary thing though. I, I, you know, that's the scary thing where all the artists know this, but sometimes it, it's scary for us to even admit that we're artists or that we're artists in, in different ways. Well, and I think the bigger problem, honestly, is that we don't lean on our artists. We don't respect them. We don't even compensate them fairly. I mean, look at them. Look at our artists right now suffering who are members of the gig economy. They're fucked. They've been for a long time. Sorry, I cuss a lot. Naturally, I, I you have a lot to be, to, to be passionate yeah, about. It's, it's just, it's just, no, it's, it's real. We talk a good game, but then we strip all the funding. I mean, yeah, like all the money that should be going to like, you know, arts and humanities and healthcare. I mean, it's all going to the Pentagon. Have we seen the budget, the budgetary breakdowns of like where we prioritize the money? So we don't, we talk a good game, but we don't show up, you know, and we need to lean on our artists in hard times. Artists remind us who we are and who we can still be, you know, they're, um, you know, that's, they bring out the best of us, honestly. And sometimes they just see things that we can't see, you know, and so we need them, like, you know, so that we, yeah, we need them now more than ever. We do need them. And I, I think that, you know, artists are a lot more. I can't write a I, I can't write a poem for crap, but if I if I tried, I feel like artists are not so intimidating, where they will talk you through it. They will understand that there are hard there are hard points, and they will understand that sometimes we may not feel qualified to be in these spaces or even to have our voices heard. Um, I'll, I'll 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 set up set it up with an example, and hopefully this will lead a little bit into more of our conversation about more right. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we, we better. I we better jump back time. in. I'm just like we're just chit chatting, but yeah, I realized it. I <laughs> Jumping back into a conversation about more right, um, something that you know the the visual image of of you know you and your sister and your cousins running around in the sand, you know, in this very special sand, mm -hmm. um, and getting to you know your your what my my auntie would say you're inhaling the island, you're living the island, and so. What, what's something that strikes out to me is, is the idea that, you know, my, this week, past weekend, um, my older brother, his, his daughter, you know, she's one years old, 
She's a little fat, so she eats um, an entire chicken nuggets meal, meal, the 10 piece meal at one years old. And so it's a little, little fat ass, but she, <laughs> she, um, you know, she, it was her first time touching sand this weekend. You know, she, she's tomorrow, her parents are tomorrow. They were in Guam. Her mom was pregnant with her in Guam and they moved out to Utah recently. And, um, you know, this baby was basically born in the pandemic, did not, has not been back home, has not touched the roots, has not touched the, has not touched, you know, real sand. She had to settle for a dirty, you know, San, San Diego, not dirty, but somewhat dirty San Diego sand. And she took a whole mouthful of it, ate it, you know, went, went, went ham. And um, it made me really happy that she got to touch the sand, but it also made me very sad. And it made me sad because, it's like this, this kid's been alive for, for about a year now, and this is the first time she's touched sand. How is it going to be when she's older? And when she grows up in, in really what is more of a diaspora type of situation where she's, she's not going to have as many opportunities to go back home, hopefully more opportunities than, than we'd hope. But I understand, and especially the more I've been out here in the States, recognizing that there's a lot of difficulties and a lot of, you know, outside factors that make it so that we don't necessarily go back home once we leave the island. But how do you reconcile kind of that disconnect with, with home? And um, more or less, like, how do you reconcile this understanding of home and magic? How do you bring that magic um, of, of feeling your homeland, of feeling the sand, of feel, of of caring for these places oh. with the real, real experiences of many of our community who don't have that opportunity to go back home or don't have that opportunity to experience it. Yeah, that's a very difficult question. I think that's the hardest one you've asked so far. To keep <laughs> frank. Um, because honestly, I am not an expert on giving advice to the diaspora. And honestly, like for the most part, I, I love our diaspora so much, you know, and I, we get along and some of the most fabulous people on earth are from this diaspora. And on the other hand, sometimes the diaspora takes up so much space, they prioritize their own voices over hours on Guam in, in ways that are significant and harmful. So like, I also feel like very, like to be, to be frank, it's a very difficult sort of thing to navigate sometimes, you know? Sometimes I feel like, for example, when North Korea is threatening us with nuclear weapons, when China actually launches four intercontinental ballistic missiles or um, four nuclear weapons into the South China Sea and names one of them Guam killer. You know, these are all happening in real time. We are living at sort of on the tip of the square on, at the colonial periphery, but we are in danger first. We're the like basically slated first for sacrifice in this country in, in a real palpable way. And when people, Chamorros in the diaspora literally feel comfortable making it all about them and how much they miss home, I could light my head on fire. I am so irritated. And I cannot, and I, I'm, I'm just being really blunt because you know, sometimes they ask for it, takes up all the space. They're willing, they just walk in the room and take up all the space and that is not okay. You know, that's probably why I wanna write the book too. You know, because like we, I, I do feel like a sense of, you know, for those of us who are living here and yes, we're all tomorrow, but for those of us living here daily life on the ground, inhaling, so to speak, all of it, including the good and the bad and the toxic chemicals, you know, because the US has contaminated us. Like we are on the ground living this in some ways, like I, that's one thing I wanna do making sure that diaspora voices don't substitute for all, you know, it's not all of our experience just, but I'm not arrogant enough to know or to believe that like my experience speaks for everyone either, but it's just an experience that we don't have enough sort of literature, you know, enough books coming from sort of being birthed on the ground here, you know? And so like, it was important to me, um, but yeah, but part of what, what more right can do and those kinds of pieces, they can really help. Like for example, your niece who's born there or, and other people who, when they read it, they can like get a sense of what I'm talking about and they, it could inspire them to want to come home to see it for themselves. But None of that is even the biggest, most important point. The most important point I think is this, and it's the political one. It's easier to rush to the rescue of a world whose magic you've actually seen and touched and turned over in your own hands. It is. Like when, when, when we have experienced like, you know, arresting beauty, when we see something that is so, or impossibly gentle or immodestly green and blue. Like if we see those things, we want to fight for them because beauty is compelling. You know, like we see the what's here, we see what we have, and we see that this place is worth fighting for. You know, so it inspires activism, honestly. 
you know? Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. Like, that's what I hope, you know, like whether we are in California or Guam, San Diego or Tumaning, wherever we are, you know, and we can fight and also, you know, fighting for and being in solidarity with other people because they're like right now this morning, like I'm like texting like friends in India, you know, like figuring out there was a huge story in NPR about just the, the, the massive upswing in COVID. I mean, it is just like a full blown crisis, um, you know, over 300,000 people infected in a day, you mm -hmm. know, the Modi administration is not nearly co competently handling what's happening. You know, and so there's so many people and so, so many of us, our, our faiths are so, you know, sh we share the planet. Like, so we should be working in solidarity with other people. And I hope that other pieces in the book also in some ways like unground us and take us around the world. You know, if that makes sense too, because, because the work of solidarity is the work of the future. It is, mm -hmm. until we see our struggles as entwined, we won't be able to combat, you know, certain things like climate change. We won't be able to fight it if we only yeah. fight it locally, we have to fight it locally and globally. No, absolutely. Trusting, it's a difficult question, really. It's, it's, it's truly like a difficult, it's a difficult space to navigate when you're talking about diaspora versus, versus those who grew up on Guam. And then there are those who are a mixture of both. Yeah. Um, those who go to school, everything, every, you know, everything in between. Yeah. And there's room for everybody to be clear. You know, there's room for everybody. That's sort of the point, you know? No mm -hmm. offering is too small. You know, we need everyone fans. Absolutely. And I think that's an, another great point that you're bringing out throughout the book is that, you know, through these little pieces, like they're, they're not little, they're, they're actually quite, quite large and, and talking, but bringing these things to life, like bringing the star sand to life, bringing Gausali to life. You know, we'll talk about that in a second, but bringing these life to life for, for people who, like my niece, will grow up in the States, you know, and bringing them in and bringing a little bit of that magic home to them. I think that is a powerful point that you bring throughout the book and helps you really to connect with a really broad range of audiences, um, not just Chamorro, but indigenous peoples, um, you know, peoples from different countries, as you mentioned earlier. And then also going into, um, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that I have time, but Basically, what I'm trying to say is you're making a great point um, that we are all part of this work. Um, going lastly into um, Gausali, you say so much hope for the future rests in the return to the right flower. Mm -hmm. And can you explain some of that broader context um, for those sure. who are not aware? So Guam's official flower is the invasive bougainvillea, which we would call Puchi Tanigu. Um, and, you know, it's one, one time, I think it was 2014, um, then Senator Judith Wampat tried to introduce a, a bill to rename the official flower and holy crap, it unleashed uh, just, uh, just a hellstorm against her. People were mocking her vociferously saying, oh, wow, you have no, <laughs> you was like, wow, there's so many real problems in Guam and you want to waste your time trying to rename a flower. I mean, it was, and it was also gendered, um, uh, just mockery. It was like clearly, it was, it was just, it was just, it was just almost unbearable to watch. You know, the like people just slamming her, and even people who, you know, it was mind blowing because she also at the same time was fighting the U.S. military buildup and doing tons of really big swing for the fences, ambitious legislation. It wasn't as if she was sitting down like yeah. only thinking about a flower. No, but she was doing what women of color often have to do, which is every damn thing at once. She's multitasking. She's trying to get the dishes to do it. It's just too much, you know? And I was just like, wow, I cannot even like bear to handle some of the, sometimes like turning on the public radio. I cannot, because I would like literally go crazy. So I, I had just, I started writing this thing for her in her honor, just because I was like, this, um, and this sort of goes to what I'm saying, what, what I'm trying to do with the book. I mean, yes, in some ways it's a poem about a flower, but it's powerful because I chose to end the entire book with a poem about a flower, which is like a return to a very, very small thing that we are all not paying attention to. And just because it's like, we have to reorient all the time. We have to re, we're rescaling the world from the bottom up, you know? It's, it, it takes like a, almost like an ideological political commitment to sort of reorient things, you know? And so like, 
Yeah, I mean, that's what, and also the limestone cliffs, you know, that they grow on, they're in danger. A lot of like limestone forests are in danger mm -hmm. from here right now, which is like death, like, like ripping the, like ripping these, you know, forests from the floor, you know, the, they, mm -hmm. they pulled those a thousand acres of limestone to make way for the various things, you know, the permanent Marine Corps base, the, you know, the live fire train, training range, you know, this is all happening right now in real time. And so like, I just felt the need to sort of do that in this book. I mean, it's like, you know, in some ways it's a protest of, you know, it's trying to invert everything. Like, you know, if big is bad, what does the opposite look like, you know? Absolutely. What if we inversely pay attention to the lives of everything more vulnerable than ourselves? What if we do that? That will inform our politics too, right? If we, as a habit can develop, if we can develop the political habit of identifying with the party with least power, we can do a hell of a lot of good work because we're always, we're always on the right side of things, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's how I think we, you know, need to try to work and think. Yes, it's, it's a poem about a flower, but you could say it's a political poem, you know? It, it is a very political poem, poem about a flower and there's a lot to unpack. And I'm so sorry that we're, we're, we're ending this note on, um, you know, at the, just the, the, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to unpacking Yosali um, and also your broader conversations about indigenous feminism. Um, I really encourage that, you know, as we enter this next portion of the Q&A to, to ask these questions about perspectives, about indigenous feminism, about, um, you know, all the things that, that are so really poignant in this book. So at this point, uh, we're gonna transition it over to audience Q&A. Um, I invite you to ask your questions, be brave. Um, and, and Anna, I think there's one person who already asked a question that we didn't get to yet. I think it was Tomas. Awesome, yeah. Let's see. Let see what it was. There Absolutely. it is. Did you see it? Yep. We have, how do we find confidence in ourselves, others outside of an American individualism, exceptionalism? Um, how do we find confidence? Oh, wow. I, I don't know exactly how to answer that question. That's a great question. Um, we just have to think through that together because I, I don't know exactly how. I just, I feel, I can only speak to my experience and I feel like I've gained a lot of confidence in watching a lot of people toil and labor outside, entirely outside of the American system. You know, like for example, I joined Progressive International, you know, and I'm on their council and now on their cabinet. And we are literally taking on so many causes at one time. We have like global debt relief to God, to observing the elections in Latin America. We're now in Turkey. We're doing, we're just doing so much like the group is doing, it's a global collective, you know? And now it's, we're just sort of like, we're trying to attend to these problems, these fires across the world. You know, we're doing it together. And so much of us, like we never frame our conversations and our work, even our, in terms of, in, in a, from an American lens, we don't do any of that. It's a truly international group. And so I gain confidence so much by actually being in real, like in community with people doing really real work, completely outside of that system. You know, and so that's where I gain my confidence. Um, you know, that, that, and I, I see it in action. I know it's possible. I mean, we, well, that's what we need to do to show people how much more is possible than they believe. Absolutely. Let me see if there's a different, another question here. I will say that, oh, go ahead. No, we, we encourage you to ask questions. Um, let me see. I have one from, from Robin. Um, he says, I read back to back headlines yesterday. One celebrated creating oxygen on Mars, the other about the oxygen shortage in India. Why are our priorities Mars over human beings on Earth? That is the million dollar question. That is the million dollar question. I, I read those headlines too. Elon Musk, anytime his name is in the title, I'm like, oh God, here we go. Or Bill Gates, or just we're always waiting on some billionaire to save it. No, we need to tax the hell out of them. 
I mean, man, I have very specific policy changes, but I won't go through that list with you all, but because our priorities are all whack. That's the answer. I mean, they're so, oh, see, it's more of a comment. Ha. Hi, Robin. I'm really digging you, Robin. We're on this. Hi, I'm, I'm snapping. <laughs> Snaps. No, because it's just, I can barely even, you know, it's like, it's almost like extreme stupidity has a way of defeating you. You know, I don't know what to say. Like, this is just so extremely stupid that I just couldn't even begin, you know, to tackle it. It's just absolute madness. But one thing I just want to repeat is that if I could have one immediate policy change right now, more than any other, I would literally defund the Pentagon and reallocate re every last bit of that $700 billion bill to pay for every other thing, including, and another thing I would do, God, I'm now sort of on a roll. The other <laughs> thing I would do right now, the other is stop this sort of like what, what we were seeing now right now is vaccine apartheid. That's what you know we're calling it because that's exactly what's happening. The U.S. and other countries, you know, are blocking, you know, the ability of poor countries. So many people in poor countries haven't even received a single dose, and you know, we are actively blocking their ability to get vaccinated. Meanwhile, many of our vaccines vaccines are wasted right here in the U.S. So no, like that's the first thing that I would do, like end call this administration to end that policy immediately. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry, it's, back to the no, point. It's it's, I'm a very political person, but I, you know, but yes, I wrote a book. <laughs> no, policy is important. It's, you know, that number one policy, I fully, I fully agree with. There are many things that we could be talking about. There are many things that we can be focusing on. And a lot of our issues could be really changed if we just recentered our, our priorities. Yeah. And I say we cautiously because, you know, our conversation with, with, with U.S. and identifying as we, is also it's a its own issue in itself, but um, going into these questions. Yeah, I'm um, reading them now. There, there's a few of them now. All right, I got one from Miss from Serena Serenity. Um, can you speak even more to the importance of relational memory in your work? Memory is a tool for liberation. Those seemingly small aspects of daily living that are no less nuanced for their smallness. How this relates to de decoloniality, resale, <coughs> and tearing reorienting world from bottom up? I don't really know how to answer that other than I do believe that it is very important of, you know, like my memories of a place, you know, really inform so how I do, and you know, even that, I mean, that's something we have to be really, really on guard against, you know, the co-opting or basically the, even the, mil the militarization of memory. Like even now, like when our roads, like recently they wanted to rename, um, uh, our main highway, you know, which was beautiful in a way because it's marine, it's like an ode o to the sea and it was changed, it was co-opted from marine to marine core drive. It, you see, in, you add one word and you flip the script, you change everything. Because when I'm driving on marine drive, I think of marine, you know, because it's alongside the ocean, the beautiful sea, you know, and I'm looking at it, it's so lovely, you know, and then you have a name change, like in one, like the next day you wake up and the world is different. And what's scary is future generations will not know that that name was actually marine drive, not marine core drive, but in anticipation of the relocation of marines from Okinawa to Guam, the entire thing changed. And that is so, oh, God, I don't even know the word for it, insidious. I mean, it's, it's so, it's portentous as hell because that means in the future, people will have no memory of this thing in a different way. It's true nature, you know? So we, you know, the memory of things are, it's just absolutely important. And so we need to fight hard as hell to like make sure that even our words are not co-opted, you know, and our, you know, like our, like for example, and other things are happening too. If you want to be really like sort of, if you're really paying attention on Guam, the U.S. Marines just did yet another tricky thing. They took a, their brand new base that was constructed against so many people of Guam's, you know, like hardcore opposition through this military buildup, but they built the first brand new permanent Marine Corps base since 1952. And all of U.S. soil was just built here. There's a ribbon convention. And what did they do? They were clever enough to name it after an indigenous Chamorro person. Do you see? Camp Blas, mm -hmm. as opposed to Camp whatever the fuck. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's now an indigenous name. And it's, it's so, and it's so portentous, you know, because it's, it's just like, like, that's what empire does. It conflates everything with you love with everything you hate. 
you know, mm-hmm. it conflates everything with that's meaningless with everything that's meaningful. It does such a masterful job of that. So writers in particular are called. We have to rescue back language itself, back from the butcher. If we have a standing, if we have a chance, you know? Yes, yeah. language matters and, and names matter. You know, even in Gausali, you talk about, um, you know, you, you the name change. Why was that name change so contentious? Mm-hmm. It wouldn't have been common sense. For, for God's sakes, the bougainvillea, every time I've seen one of those, those flowers, like they are filled with spiders, filled, filled to the brim with spiders. And, and it just shocks me why anyone would choose that one over the, over, over Gasali. And just, no. but that, that's part of my own personal, personal thing with, with, with spiders. But um, going back to these questions, um, I do want to acknowledge that we have a- um, How are we on time? Erica? Yeah, how are we, Erica? Just so we know. We can think- take a couple more questions. I think we have somebody raised their hand and there are two questions <laughs> in the chat and then we can finish up with those. Okay, so we'll just take these last three questions. And because I, I also am aware that, you know, people's time is limited and I think we've just went over an hour. Okay, I'll just go, I'll just quickly go. The next question is, oh, about capitalism. Um, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you know, the new world we're collectively trying to, you know, imagine, but also build, you know, has to mean that we have to change all of the sort of macroeconomic policies that, you know, come with capitalism, you know, like this whole neoliberal framework, the Washington consensus, this like massive deregulation and privatization, like all of that has to go, you know, like we, that, I mean, that I think is an obvious, but of course I'm not the best, I'm not an economist. I would defer to people like, you know, like, God, there's so many good ones. Joseph Stiglitz maybe, or, um, but no, but Naomi Klein too does a masterful job in taking those sort of economic theories and turning them and explaining why capitalism and its sort of variants and how we've come, how basically capitalism is at war with the life affirming systems on earth, you know, and how they're like diametrically opposed and can't be reconciled. I would suggest her work as a really good um, accessible reading. The next thing, um, Oh no, people are, is that more questions? Okay, we'll just quickly get through them. I'm sorry, very quickly. The next is about, oh wait, Rob, oh, it's Robin. Oh, it's she's saying it's an actual question now, hold on. You have a question the, by Kay, Kay, Kay again um, on the, he was raising his hand earlier. Oh, sorry, go, go. Oh, yeah. Hi, I, she, just, sorry. Hi, I just unmuted uh, myself, it's Kay Go. I just wanna say thank you and um, I guess, I, I just love that you have this duality of activism. You have a like a legal background and you're also this poet and artist and have so much empathy. Um, and I think I'm one of those folks um, not living on the land and an immigrant uh, in the US. And you know, I'm, I'm trying to understand how to support indigenous rights and rights of other places where I, when I'm not there. And it's also this sense of urgency um, but also this sort of like, um, because your work is also, this recent work is also about healing, is how do you find the balance between the urgency and the priorities <laughs> of fighting? And then, um, you know, it's just, there's just so, especially when you're a person of color or you're connected or, um, and you see other folks fighting for other causes or other, you know, there's just like the whole white savior people and you're like you want to fight but there's so much healing as well that's happening and it's trying and I just I could listen to you for another hour or two just because you have such an incredible balance of this activism and organizing but then this poetic and this empathic side of you that can come together and I think that's such a good model for brown folks to figure that out and um I'm just trying to figure out how you balance that. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Keiko. I appreciate that very much. Um, and uh, no, it's, I honestly just try my best to balance. And I think the thing that we have to realize it's, you know, the thing about balance is like this endless pursuit, right? You have it one moment, you don't have it the next. I mean, I think that's a really realistic answer. We st- we search for it because, you know, like, I mean, you know, the I think the best kind of life is in the balance somewhere. We have to have all of that. And the book, yeah, and I totally appreciate what you're saying. Like, we are up against a lot here. We, there's so many things that feel very urgent. Um, <clears throat> is, I, for me, I'm able to feel, 
I'm lucky because I feel like my love and my work are not actually really disconnected. I'm in, and I wish that was more common, but I believe it's rare where you have an integrated life where you're able to sort of heed all the voices in yourself. You know what I'm saying? So I'll give you an example. I don't feel disempowered about what's happening now with the US military buildup of Guam. I don't because I'm working hard as hell to fight empire and uh, to be concrete about, and I'm not just talking about it. You see, that's the other thing, like it's not abstract or academic, it's active and concrete. Like we just filed a submission against the US government with three UN special rapporteurs. We just, as of two weeks ago, we secured a historic joint allegation letter against the US that, that were signed by multiple rapporteurs. And we did that, my firm did that. And I did that and I was like, okay, I did something concrete in the world and I stand, stood up in opposition and I had some degree of success. So not everyone, you know what I mean? But I think not everyone can do that because not everyone's a human rights lawyer, but what everyone can do is do the same similar type of thing. Take the war and chisel it down into bite-sized battles and try to win them one by one. I don't know if that makes sense for everyone, but for me, if I wasn't really acting concretely in the world, I would be in despair. I would literally feel depressed, but I'm not because I'm concretely engaged in doing things that can make a difference. And then I let go, you know, and then I let go and it's enough. Like whatever the activist community in Guam, the broader movement wants to do, I've gave them a tool. I tooled them with this thing, with this now like great sort of precedent setting thing that they can run with into the win. You know, like I don't, I, but it's not my job to run into the win. I can't do it all. I could only do what I could do. I was responsible for my own portion of the relay. And that's, and then I give, and then I let go, you know? And then I pay attention to my little dog or my partner who's, you know, having a hard time at work and I'm trying to take more load, you know, off of him and do more of the dishes or the cooking because I, it's all of it is connected, you know? Like I was only able to write the book, honestly, because he did so much of the invisible, unpaid labor that is caretaking, that is cooking meals for a loved one. So like if, for example, if you have a loved one and they're writing a book and they're trying to write a book that's really helpful for you, like if you can show up for them, sometimes you show up for the whole world by showing up for another individual human being to your left or to your right, who's really in need of your attention and aid, you know? And sometimes it's small. Again, I keep saying this, but like, sometimes it's all of those big things, but it's really all of these small things too. And like last year, he was able to give me the time I needed to write this book. And now I have more time. So out of reciprocity, which is a Chamorro value, I would say it's the highest Chamorro value as a people, as an as a people I know we are word for it. It's reciprocity, it's enough amalek, you know? It's all of the, and we have an intricate cultural protocol for this, but basically that's the idea in practice. So it's my turn to step up and do more of the cooking and the dishes and the cleaning, like, because I, because that it's, it's shared, you know? I hope that makes sense to go. It's in those small things. And I also have to say, um, you know, you're, you're, I, I know we have a whole bunch of questions, but I also just really want to emphasize to people to, to conserve your energy and, and take pride in those small victories. I had never felt more useless than I, when I worked for the United Nations, <laughs> if, if, that, if that makes sense. Um, you know, you would think that you, you know, you would, you would be in these spaces and you would be making a big impact and all that kind of stuff, but I had never felt more useless. And so take those small victories, even if that's cooking a meal, as Jillian said, for your significant other. Um, yeah. So I think, I think there's only two more and, or one more. Um, yes, I, I yeah. have one, uh, from Robin asking, um, I'm sorry if I'm butchering this, but, uh, were, were the poems, um, more right and, and Mugu were um, speaking from spoken from a, a youth were sorry you write so truthfully from youth and capture that experience of being young and seeing the world in that way were those poems written <clears throat> then or now? no <clears throat> they were written now some of the, the pieces are written um, older but but those were written now which I guess you know I, I guess what I know why you're asking the question because they feel like they could have been written then you know because they were like very childlike but I guess for me, I just really haven't sort of lost that. My memory is shit in some ways, but it's really good in in like in the in in the sense that I'm like I remember really clearly certain moments of my life. So I wrote them now, but thinking mm -hmm. back. Um, and then the very last question is from Serenity. 
I'm reading it now. Could you speak more to how you, oh, decided on the title Properties of Perpetual Life? Um, basically, um, I took it from the Catholic prayer for the dead. This, you know, like when we pray, you know, we were praying and I was talking about how we had experienced so much death on Guam and we're always coming back from someone's rosary. And at that rosary, you know, we say the Catholic prayer for the dead, at least most of the community does. And it's, may they let, um, may their eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and may perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace, this idea. And I've recited it thousands of times and we do as children who are dragged to so many rosaries, but we don't really, really, take a deep dive into the meaning of the words we say. So it's really an homage to this idea of interrogating the language that we use all the time. And so I was saying that when we're saying that prayer, although we don't think about it, we're offering, when we say that particular line, we're <clears throat> asking God for our loved one's safe passage. And we're offering the only thing we have, which is our love to light their way. And so, yeah, this book is lovingly trying to light, you know, the way, especially for young people who feel lost in the dark. So. I know that Serenity mentioned, um, she's looking especially at the word properties in the properties oh. of perpetual light. <clears throat> yeah, just really also. unpacking that. It's unpacking what the perpetual light is. I say in the book that if you read it, the if we know from the Bible that the only thing to precede light is love. You know, so it's like the ancient beauty. It's like the thing, the sustaining power. And so I also like, I talked about a little bit when I read The Alchemist for the first time, it talked about how um, The Alchemist explained to the young boy after days of traveling the desert that um, people who are only interested in turning gold, I mean, turning, God, I can't remember exactly the, the phrase <laughs> I used, but basically understanding the alchemy is like all like, um, copper, lead, they all have different properties, right? And I was like, you know, this meditation on property, I was like, in the same way that the earth metals have different properties, what about their spiritual counterparts, like hope and faith? They have different properties too. And so I was really trying to really think about what that would look like. And yeah, so I I just felt very certain about that title. As soon as I it came to me, I was like, oh, this is absolutely correct. This is it. Thank you all so much. Everyone, feel free to unmute yourselves, show them some love. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. I wish we had more time, um, but please feel free to buy the book. Um, you can check it out on our website, asiabookcenter.com. Um, oh, if, if you can, um, we're gonna take a, a quick photo. Uh, so if you, if you feel comfortable, um, you can turn your camera on and then we'll take that photo. Oh, sorry, Kat. Um, we can, we'll take the photo first and then we can pull up the slides. Um, so let's see. All right, gallery view. I see all of your <laughs> beautiful faces. Okay. All right, I'm gonna count, count off. One, two, three. Okay, another one. One, two, three. And the last one. One, two, three. Awesome. Thank you all for being here. Um, we really, really appreciate everyone um, sharing their time with us. And of course, um, Anna and Julian. Um, and please, please pick up a copy of the book. I think we actually just sold out, but we should be restocking. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you again. And if you Want to check out more of our programs, go to asiabookcenter.com. We have a few um, things coming up, including our book club. Um, we will also be uh, uploading this uh, recording to our, our YouTube channel. So if you came late, um, if you want to share with someone, um, we can, we'll send that link over to you uh, via uh, the Eventbrite email. So you all have a great rest of your weekend and hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Thank you everybody so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Be well.